be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your son Jesus and for the life uh, he gives. Help us now, Lord, to uh, be renewed in that life that uh, you've poured out upon us. And help us to be renewed in it daily and to walk with you in uh, humbleness of heart until that day when you uh, come to make all things new, that day that we anticipate where you will put sin and death under your feet once and for all and uh, bring to life the life that you desire. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to look at the sacraments today. Um, if you have your catechism, let's take a look at that. If you don't, I've got some here. Or well, we've got some hymnals that we can use too. Your knees are better than ours. There you go. No, it's a free app. So, um, if you look at the catechism, page 28, at least in the one I just handed out, it's page 28. Um, so, we see the sacrament of holy baptism through page 30, and then... Um, Verse thir or chat page thirty one. How are people? How people are taught to confess? Um, and then to page thirty three, the sacrament of the altar. Um, so in between baptism and communion, we get this idea of confession. And uh, were any of you taught to confess? And why does this fall between the sacraments? Do you think, in terms of the way Luther laid this out? Any hunches on that, Jim? When I was confirmed, uh, that was at a time yet where you had communion four times a year, and you, before communion, you would arrange an appointment with the pastor and go in and have a private mm -hmm. consultation. It wasn't basically announcing yourself. Okay, but it wasn't called confession, or. No. But it was an opportunity. So what do you think about that? Because um, I have never experienced that as a person or a pastor. Well, <laughs> I'm just saying as a, as a lay person or a pastor, I've never experienced that sort of formality in, the, in and around yeah. the sacrament. Um, was it good or was it not so good? What do you think? Uh, for me, it was one time because right after we were confirmed, they did away with it. Oh, really? Okay. And, and, uh, so it didn't just fade away, they just did away with yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I think they used it so they could keep track of who took, who took, took, took communion. Communion, yeah. yeah. A lot of it was... Well, I know I heard stories uh, in Belmont, my first call about, you know, the days when they would have that practice, and then... And, they wouldn't actually practice communion in the worship service. If you wanted communion, you stayed after and received it. It's like, that's totally foreign to me. I mean, yeah. the way I've learned about the sacraments, the, the, yeah. the meal is the central part of the worship. You know, it's, it's really... Uh, and for those of you uh, to whom that is foreign, who grew up with four times a year, or even once a month, this idea that the meal is central is probably a little bit foreign to you. Um, well, the, the, another side of this is that in serving congregations, I have found among some older people um, that they <coughs> would deprive themselves of communion because they did not feel worthy. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm lack of feeling worthy on their part uh, and uh, not wishing to eat and drink condemnation onto themselves yeah. which is kind of a misinterpretation of what Paul was saying 
Was that you who was quoting that scripture and talking about the? You want to talk any more about that? Sure. <clears throat> so in uh, you know where we get to, oh, the Paul telling the Corinthians these words of institution. You know, I give unto you what I received. Uh, you know, on the night in which he was betrayed, we get those words in First Corinthians chapter eleven, and then Paul goes on to say, you know, but when you gather for this meal, uh, some of you eat and get filled, and others go home hungry. And Paul is talking there about an actual full meal. In the early church, they would have gathered and had an actual meal. Um, and so immediately after that, Paul says, so when you eat and drink, you know, you're drinking condemnation on, on yourself. So Paul's addressing a specific issue with the Corinthians where they're gathering for this meal and people are who are a little more wealthy are, you know, gorging themselves on this meal while people who don't have as much are get sent home hungry again. And so Paul's chastising them, but we have we have taken that and used it in this practice of guarding the table, you know, making sure that people are prepared and worthy, worthy to receive. So we've gone beyond what what Paul's concerns were there. We've kind of taken it and made it a pietistic issue mm -hmm. rather than a very practical issue that right. it was. Yeah. So, so the church does have, I think, um, kind of a long history of, of um, understanding of this meal. And we're, we're jumping ahead of baptism for a moment. We'll come back to baptism, but uh, you know, uh, the Catholic Church for years withheld the cup for the, from the laity. They have now since changed that for the most part, I understand. Um, but uh, it's a common cup, so if you don't care to use the common cup, you still don't get the wine. Is that the practice in every Catholic church? Well, any of them that we've been to? <laughs> yeah. Quite a few don't. I wouldn't be afraid of a common cup, but um, there are people who would. That's, yeah. So, I, you know, in teaching the confirmation kids, I always try to get them to wrestle with, you know, the, this idea that it's the form by which we, and ask the question, is it the form by which we commune, or is it these words that Christ gave us that institute this as a sacrament, you know? So, you know, the, the bottom line that I'm trying to get them to think about is that it's not about the form. We can eat uh, real bread and, and uh, a cup out of the same, or a drink out of the same cup, or you know, individual cups or wafers, or you know, there's all kinds of forms in tinction at the at the rail, um, in a circle, in the pew. You know, there's all kinds of ways that we can practice this sacrament. But as long as it's Christ who is the host of that meal and who declares, "This is my body and blood for you," it's uh, it is the meal of Christ. Whenever we're away from here, uh, we try to worship locally, wherever that happens to be. And on a number of occasions, the only Lutheran church was uh, Missouri Synod. And in sensitivity to a lot of those congregations, I have always tried to introduce myself to the pastor beforehand and ask if it would be okay if we were to commune. And on a number of occasions, I have been refused. I've told them that I'm a Lutheran pastor, but I'm not of the right ilk. Oh, my. Pastor Steve was not allowed to go back to his home congregation and take communion. Yeah, Renee doesn't. Pastor typically Denver. get to it at our home congregation. Yeah. Missouri? Yeah, Missouri. Yeah. Missouri. Yeah, I can get Missouri too. Yeah, and even if I go to a congregation and worship when I'm away from here um, and they don't have communion, to me it just doesn't feel like we worship yeah. really. That's how much of a central part that is for my worship experience. I have told pastors that refused me communion that I, I got so much out of the liturgy that I would I, I will surely get a lot out of your worship service. So 
Even if you don't get to commune, you mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. I get so much from the worship. Good. Yeah. But I resent the inclus the inclusiveness of the whole thing when they exclusiveness or inclusiveness. Well, uh, exclusive. I might be using yeah, yeah. I'm maybe. I was thinking inclusive meaning only their own oh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. only their own yeah. people. Yeah. Um, Nature. Yeah, yes. well, and the way I understand that is that the pastor takes, literally, you might say, the words that um, he or she, it wouldn't be she in that, those denominations, but um, that you should know the heart of the people and, you know, that you, as a pastor, you don't want to serve somebody so that they eat and drink condemnation upon themselves either, right? Yes. So, um, but I can't know any of your hearts any more than I can know the hearts of uh, a stranger in right. some ways, you know what I mean? Um, I can know your practices and your faithfulness and those sorts of things, but, but for me, to God is the one who knows your heart. Um, when I go to church with Mark and Gardner, I don't take communion. Have you asked? No, okay. I haven't. I yeah. think because they have a rule there and... Okay. And I abide by the rule yeah. and I respect the rule. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think he would allow you if you asked, because I know someone else that came from this church that goes there, and he, is, he can take communion there. Pastor, I grew up in a congregation where on Saturday, we didn't have communion that often, but the Saturday before, you would go and yeah. meet with the pastor, but I don't think it was so much a confessional as, as an opportunity if you needed to talk something over. Sure. Kind of a good way to I think keep in touch good. with uh, yeah. your congregation too. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I've often thought about or occasionally thought about setting up some hours like that, but I don't know if anybody can come or not. You, know. <laughs> you want me to come to church on Saturday evening and talk to you about what? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's, uh, let's move to baptism again, page 28. Um, baptism, and we start with baptism because it's the, uh, what Luther calls the entrance um, into the Christian community, right? He says, baptism, it is through baptism which we are first received into the Christian community. So it's about... Uh, it's about sharing blood, isn't it? We become, in a sense, blood relatives. Um, and, um, again, it's not our blood or our genetics, but it's Christ's, right? It's Christ's blood that we share that makes us brothers and sisters. So, uh, Baptism is not simply uh, plain water. Instead, it is water used according to God's command and connected with uh, God's word. This is the thing that Luther just continually comes back to in, uh, in the large catechism, is this idea that it's not simply plain water. It's, if you separate it from the word, yes, it's no different than water you would use to brush your teeth with, or for the maids to cook with, he says. But, uh, but when it's together with God's word, and again, as Steve Smith has been teaching, it's not W-O-R-D, all lowercase, it's capital W-O-R-D, right? The Word of God. And who is that Word of God? Christ Jesus. Right. Uh, last um, Wednesday I read the uh, piece from uh, uh, the use of the means of grace that, that talked about Christ. It is Christ, Jesus, in the center of these meals, or in this meal and in this uh, practice of communion that, that makes all the difference. It's, um, it's that Word of God um, that comes to us Again, through Christ's command and and um, and be, through being connected with through this uh, element, earthly element, um, along with God's promises. So, what what then is this word of God? Where uh, where our Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew twenty eight, "Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit." He also quotes in the large catechism, Mark uh, sixteen sixteen. Um, those who believe and are baptized shall be saved, and those who are who do not believe um, shall be condemned. He uses uh, that also as a uh, source of God's command to baptize. <clears throat> 
And he talks in the large catechism too about, you know, how is baptism defended against heretics and sectarians? He says, leave that to the learned. <laughs> Every once in a while he'll say that. Leave this to the learned. And, you know, I think we could read that as kind of... Uh, um, Don't worry about it. Ar arrogant. Well, I, I think as arrogant, we could be read as arrogant. Luther was far more educated than most of the folks in his day. But I, I really think that it's more meant to be pastoral. Don't, don't be burdened by fears of, um, you know, whether this has been corrupted or, you know, is, has fallen under the hands of heretics or sectarians. He's, you know, because Luther believed wholeheartedly that uh, where the word of God is spoken and um, uh, that, that there is, that God's action is true. So if, if, um, if the pastor were an alcoholic, you know, you, you say you had your children baptized and then you found out your pastor was an alcoholic and a womanizer and a, you know, whatever else you might consider um, horrible offenses, Luther would say your baptism, your, the baptism of your child is, is, is valid. Again, not because of the pastor. Even if your pastor is totally upright and, um, you know, walks in the way of the Lord, um, that isn't what gives your child's baptism validity or your own uh, baptism validity. It's the fact that Christ is there. The Word of God is there. Um, so again, I think when Luther says, leave it to the learned, he isn't meaning that as some arrogant statement, but it's a way to say... Um, you know, it's a way for his pastor, it's his pastoral word to the people. Uh, what gifts or benefits does baptism grant? It brings about forgiveness of sins, redeems from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe it. And again, I like to replace the word believe with trust, simply because uh, it fits... Uh, what I think is meant more appropriate, pr appropriately than this word believe. We can turn that so much easily into a work um, as the words of, and promise of God declare. So there's a story about a woman whose grandson was uh, learning to, well, he was becoming a pilot and he had gotten his uh, beginner's license or whatever so he could solo uh, fly the smaller aircraft. And so he, he wanted to take his grandma up in the plane and, and uh, she was a rather large woman. Maybe I've told you this story before. but uh, she, And she was terrified. She didn't want to go, but it was her grandson, so okay, I'll go. So they, they get her to the airplane, and um, she kind of crawls up the steps of the plane, and they kind of push Grandma in. It was a small two-seater, and, and uh, get the door closed, and the grandson you know, gets the plane off the ground, and here they are flying through the air. And, She's not saying a word, but you know he's having the time of his life, and <clears throat> he noticed at one point she's holding on to this this strap up here above her. Didn't really say anything; just kind of want, you know noticed that. So they get done with the flight, they land, everything went very smoothly. The grandson finally says, "Well, Grandma, what did you think of your flight, your first flight in an airplane?" And she said, "Well, it was okay," she said, "but you know I never really did let my weight down." <laughs> 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 she, she thought she was holding herself up. <laughs> uh, but that story, what that story communicates for me is this idea of trust, you know, letting your weight down, trusting in that which God has promised. Uh, Luther talks about uh, quite a bit in this, in this large catechism about not, um, not putting your, your stock in what you do or in what... Uh, you know, what the pastor does, but it's, it's again, it's more about what God is doing here, and it's this living word that's in our midst uh, to to de not only to declare but to enact what what is promised there. So, um, <clears throat> so we can trust this God who uh, who makes these promises. So, what are these words and promises of God? Again, now he talks about Mark sixteen, where our Lord Christ says in Mark sixteen. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. Um, John 3.16 basically says that. 
I think John 3.16 says uh, probably more clearly in my estimation that they're condemned already because they haven't received or haven't uh, uh, believed or trusted in that word of God, right? Um, Grandma was fine as long as uh, the plane, were, everything mechanically worked right, right? But if that plane started to go down, she couldn't have held herself up, you know, and... Uh, the same is true for us. We can't hold ourselves up. We can't. Uh, we can't save ourselves. I was wondering about these people that don't get their children baptized. We've got some great nieces and nephews that are baptized. Well, the thing it doesn't say here is those who are not baptized are condemned. It says those who do not believe. Is there salvation outside of baptism? I think the church has to acknowledge that there is. That God is bigger than than just. Than, than baptism, but I think what baptism is for me is that visible assurance. You know, it's 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 our wit eye witness to the account that God has claimed this child, that God has laid His mark upon that child, and that, that, that there's one especially that he he's gone to and and proclaimed his Christianity. In, you know, it's not really a Baptist church. I think it's the Assembly of God or something like that. But he hasn't been baptized yet. Yeah. Any idea what he's waiting for? I don't know. He's yeah. in his 20s. I mean, Luther would say that once you understand even a fraction of what's offered in baptism, you would come running, you know. And mm -hmm. That you would desire it so greatly that you would come running for it. And, yeah. Yeah. Yep, there were and some... then I have, have three... Three others too that have never been baptized. Yeah. Their dad was Catholic and she was a Lutheran. Okay. Yeah. They've never gone to church. Okay. Wow. Yet there were some of the early church fathers I have come to understand who held off their baptism, even though they believed, they held off their baptism until they were on their deathbed mm -hmm. and then were baptized so that there was no possibility of them sinning from that point oh. on. That's a, you know interesting concept yeah. of it, but you know uh, I I have also seen the other side of it where uh, yeah. Grandma or an aunt say. or an uncle just pesters and pesters and pesters, right. and sometimes have even taken a child to the church without the parents' knowledge to sarcastically, I'm going to say, get them zapped with the magic bullet of baptism, mm -hmm. you know. And, and I think that that's a gross abuse of, of the sacrament as well, yeah. you know, uh, because there, there is no intention to, to carry out what in our uh, order of baptism, the parents and the sponsors say, we promise yeah. that we will do such and such. And there is absolutely no intent on their part to ever do any of it. On the parents' part. On the parents' yeah. part. Yeah. yeah. Those grandparents who do what you're saying may have They may if, but if yeah. the child even lives there close enough. Right, right. That's an issue today. But yet yeah. if that grandparent doesn't believe that you are not, you will not go to heaven yeah. without the baptism, right. how would you live with that, right. knowing that your grandchild might, right. uh, yeah. you know, if that's what they've been taught and that's what they right. believe? Yeah. Well, and another issue was uh, miscarriage or, you know, uh, death uh, at birth, and Luther, yeah. Luther assured mothers, again, his pastoral words to, to mothers were, um, you know, your, your motherly prayers for your child while in utero or in, in the uterus surrounded by the water of the womb are as good as baptism, Luther said, you know. So, uh, so again, trying to reassure uh, folks that, that God isn't this uh, uh, judge waiting to zap us or to uh, strike us down, but to uh, give us life. Barb? At the risk of being... Consistently. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> one thing they can say about Barb is she was consistent. <laughs> <laughs> well, how does this, uh, the one who believes and is baptized, yeah. how does this go along with you don't need to do anything because of grace? Well, again, if we, uh, that's why I like to 
Uh, change the word to trust, yeah, because again, that grandmother couldn't do anything to hold her up, else hold herself up, but she fooled herself into thinking she could. But, um, so he who trusts and believes will be saved, um, or he who is he who trusts and is baptized will be saved, right? So again, baptism is about God's work, right? It's not about our work, but it's about God's work, and so the same is true with the trust. Um, to make that a work is, um, it's like the grandmother in the airplane. She couldn't do anything. So to, for us to make uh, trust or belief a work, it will not save us, right? It, it's simply about putting your weight down in the arms of the one who carries you, um, and the one who has made promises to you. Um, so again, it's all about God's work, God's foundation, God's uh, saving activity in our lives. So that's how I, I... I like the very first sentence that you said, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> Trust or belief is not an act? It's not a word. Yeah, to make it a, a word. word. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. When I say, uh, I mean, to say I... I mean, that whole word believe is a problem, problematic word in some ways for us in English. Because um, to say I believe in... Santa Claus, right? I mean, there's that kind of belief, but I just believe Santa Claus is out there somewhere. Um, and it doesn't require anything of me, except to say I believe it, right? to think it somehow. Um, but then there's also a belief that leads to uh, action, and uh, it, it causes us to move. It, it changes our life. It causes us to, to uh, do things differently. If I believe in... Um, the power of love, you know, just think about young love. If I believe in the power of love, that changes me. I mean, I, suddenly I'm focused on this, this girl, I'm bringing her flowers, I'm, you know, showering her with attention, and right? I mean, we, we've all probably experienced that at one point in our life. Um, that kind of belief changes things. And, um, so to have that kind of trust, that I trust in this one who holds me, that, that will change our life as well. Uh, but again, it's not a work that we do. It's, it's, it's a force that has impacted me. This, this idea of love is a force that has come upon me, that has somehow changed my life without my asking for it, without my uh, intentionality. It, it, it changes my actions and my behavior. So again, that belief or trust is, is you know, grows through faith, which again is a gift from God that's talked about in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, so, Leanne, Lee you had a... <coughs> yeah, you know, uh, Luther does have a section about infant baptism in his uh, large catechism, and uh, basically... Well, first he rails against those who are um, who are saying baptism is of no use because it's a it's a, what's he call it a um, it's an outward sign I think is what it's called so um, so he rails against those it's a it's a thing of the flesh it doesn't really do anything um, so he rails against them saying that. Uh, that, that faith needs something to hold on to is what he ta is the way he talks about that. And so um, he says the water connected with God's word, the water is kind of this thing that we hold on, that faith holds on to, this water of life and renewal. But as so, far as it obeying the believing, I mean, yeah, that yeah. makes it sound like they have to do something, but yeah. it isn't the baby that has to do Exactly. Be. So yes, the church is always the... the Lutheran Church, the church that followed Luther, the Church of the Reformation, did not give up on the practice of infant baptism. There, there were those again who took, uh, who took those reforms farther and said that again, baptism has a, is of no use because it's an, it's a thing of the flesh, and so just um, we're saved by faith alone. So you know, it's not of it's not of any use. But Luther, uh, Luther really disagrees with that because it is commanded by God, and it's it's. Um, it's uh, given with the promise of life and salvation, right? That the de death and the devil and, and uh, his, earth, his forces will be defeated. So, yeah, Luther, 
I think he wrestled with that, the idea of infant baptism, but he, he comes back to it's about what God is doing. It's all about what God is doing. And he even talks, he even says in the large catechism that if a person doesn't have faith after they're baptized, that's really of little consequence to us, he says. Because God is faithful. Uh, you know, and that, I think that will cause us all to squirm just a little bit, doesn't it? Again, but if a person doesn't have faith after they're baptized, uh, I mean, that, makes, that should make us think a little bit. What happens then? But Luther says it's a little consequence, and I, I don't know. I, I, have, I have a question. It used to be dedication. Christ was dedicated yeah. at 8, yeah. wasn't baptized until 30. Right, right. Some churches continue with that, mm -hmm. with the child is dedicated. Mm -hmm. Does that then put the responsibility more on the parents and the sponsors yeah. at dedication and they make sure that they he knows the relationship of Christ <laughs> and then when they get older and come to their own realization they are baptized mm -hmm. and then they give testimony of what it means to dedicate your life to Christ mm -hmm. and I was wondering did Luther's in Luther's time did he ever experienced that? I know it's Christ who works in us, yeah. but anyway, if the parents have been baptized and they want their child to know about Christ, they dedicate him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I know I'm familiar with that practice, not in practice, but in, you know, well, Baptist know. neighbors and that sort of thing. Yeah. So. A number of churches still do this. They yeah. dedicate the child. Yeah. It's a responsibility of the parents yeah, I don't. What do you all think about that? I just, I well, don't know. How to, I don't know how to answer you on that one. I just wonder when it changed. You know, is it, well, I don't think the Lutheran Church ever dedicated that I'm aware of. No, oh. I, I, I draw comparisons between a number of these things. Uh, one of my daughters married to a really fine guy who's uh, comes out of a a Baptist kind of tradition. Uh, they're not members of a Baptist church now, but one of these that is of that tradition. Uh, There's a Swedish we, covenant that's like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what they call themselves. You know, it's a community church. Yeah. But we baptize uh, as infants. I went to the dedication of my grandson uh, within the tradition that my daughter and her husband were in. So baptism, dedication. In both situations, the parents make a promise that we are going to place into the hands of this child God's word. Teach them the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer. I know the promise is yeah. there, the but promise can they there. do it Well, it's not... It's the same thing applies whether it's Lutherans that are baptized or whether it's uh, the, the, the group that uh, goes with the dedication style. So then you have a, a period of years where there is instruction that is given. Uh, uh, within uh, the Lutheran tradition, we have confirmation. Another name for that, affirmation of baptism, where that young person stands up and says, as an infant, this is in effect what they're saying, as an infant I was baptized on the basis of my parents' faith, mm -hmm. because at that point I had no faith. I had no trust. Right. That trust was developed through the years of instruction that I was uh, growing in this family. My daughter's situation. Through the years of, of instruction uh, within the church and, and within the home, uh, the child grew. Now, they come to a point in their life where they say, I am now ready to make a declaration of faith on my own. Affirmation of baptism, declaration of faith and, and baptism at 
oftentimes roughly the same point in life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. But how many of them is it real, and has it been left up <coughs> to professionals, teachers rather than parents? Well, That's where I guess the, the, the dedication yeah. to me is that um, yeah. the parents have the responsibility, and with yeah. infant baptism. Are we assured that the parents are going to do this? No, we're not. No, no, <laughs> no, we're, not. no we're not. Yeah. When, 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 when can the Holy Spirit come into a person's life? Now, Whenever it pleases. That, you know, when, <laughs> huh? Whenever it pleases. Yes. Whenever, yeah. And remember that John the Baptist jumped for joy yeah, even when Jesus and yeah. Mary were coming down the road. Right. Yeah, I, so, you know, I, so we, yeah. the Holy Spirit can enter us at any time <coughs> of life. And I don't want to get hung up on the question of infant baptism, but uh, I wrestle with this whole idea of dedication also, because can I, as a parent, really dedicate my child to anything? You know, in a world with, that we live in today, with uh, uh, I mean, parents give their children the choice of whether to go to church or not often right after they're confirmed, even sometimes before. I mean, parents are putting so much power in their children's hands, not wanting to tell them what to do, that um, we just have this uh, idea that people should be totally free to do whatever they want to do, in a sense. So um, can I really dedicate my child to do anything? I mean, again, I understand that biblically because there were people who dedicated their children to the Lord, right? Hannah, I think, uh, was one of them. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, I get that, but um, I don't quite understand it, Laurel. You have, then in Martin Luther's time and through the years, before you took communion, were you supposed to be baptized? Could you not be baptized and take Holy Communion? Right. What? Right what? You could? You had to be baptized to take communion. You had to be baptized yes. to take Holy yes. Is that still... That's the general practice. Um, there are congregations who have said um, that if all are welcome at the table, they don't make baptism a requirement for But isn't community. that what we say everybody's welcome? I mean, we, we do. Say, were you yeah. baptized? Yeah. Yeah. I'm more comfortable if I at least know they're moving toward baptism. Yeah. Um, but that was an integral part of communion that yeah. you be baptized. Yeah. I, the church is actually talking about that today with uh, <coughs> Bishop Eaton's leadership. They're asking the question. You know, I just what, don't ever remember that coming up. It was an assumed thing that right. no one would take communion unless you were baptized because yeah. you wouldn't be in church unless you were baptized. But in this day and in age, this day and age things have changed. And yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Right. Uh, right. I have an area that I differ with you a little bit on when it comes to baptism. Good. Uh, Let's hear it. Make me squirt. <laughs> Uh, you, at the end of the baptismal service, you say, uh, yes. will you pray for this child? Oh, yeah, good. And then yeah. you say, absolutely. Yeah. I have a hard time with that because yeah. I go home and maybe forget. You maybe don't, never yeah. do pray. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so with God's help, <laughs> I like that kind of terminology yeah. more than absolutely. So will you, Jim, pray for Johnny, right? Yeah. For how long? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. How do you spell Johnny? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you say absolutely, but then you go home and next week you don't even pray for Johnny. Right. 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 So, That's where I'm coming from. Yeah. I've had others say the same thing, and I think it's good that you think about that because you're right. You probably won't pray for. Who did we baptize? We had two baptisms last month. What were their names? Most of us, most of us couldn't even tell us their names. Grace. Grace. Yeah. The point is, when you say absolutely, you're promising to pray for, I say, all the baptized. And as children of God, shouldn't we pray? I mean, that's probably the one thing that we can say we should do is pray for all the baptized, right? To, to grow into that baptism. This is our Dell struggle to, uh, you know, to, to help those parents who were baptized and now have brought that child to baptism to be faithful to their promises. So I think as a good practice for prayer life is that we do pray for all the baptized. And I think in that spirit, we can say absolutely. No, you won't pray for that child specifically. Um, but will we pray for the for all the baptized? Then we can say absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's good to keep educating on that. No, it's a, 
others have said the same thing. So. Because you have said that, we, um, those of us who pray on Tuesdays, yeah. we put that into awesome. our Great. prayers Perfect. because Thank I you. thought, how else are right. we going right. to mm -hmm. remember this? Yeah. Yeah. Do you do it by name? Or do you well, do it the by first name? week after they're baptized, we do it by name. Mm -hmm. And then otherwise, we do it as yeah. all yeah. baptized. All yeah. Yeah. This becomes a case in point why it is so important that people, uh, children are baptized into the life of a congregation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens is that if you have people who are coming who are not members of the church, who are maybe visiting grandma for the, for the weekend, yeah. and they're going to be baptized, but they actually live in Florida or Des Moines or someplace else, and, and they're baptized here, and then they go, we never see them again. Right. But if they are baptized into the life of this congregation because they are members here, then we can surround them. Then we can make sure that they have a better chance of being instructed in the faith. Yeah. You know, that's really not <clears throat> all, all our doing. It's God's touching them that with baptism and that they may go back to their church 20 years later, right. they may say, I believe, I trust yeah. in Jesus Christ. Yeah. You don't know. Well, you that, can't make that judgment, yeah. I don't think. Which is why we always, I always say we should lean towards grace, right? Yes. But, right. Yes. but I think we need to raise those questions. If somebody from um, far away calls me and says, can we have our child baptized? Those are the kind of questions I ask. Is Do you have uh, where will we transfer this child's membership to? You know, because we can't do the things we promised to do. Right. The whole church can do them, but we can't do them if your child's uh, hither and young. Um, I appreciate your explanation. Yeah. So. Yeah. What happened to that wonderful thing with all the doves that we had hanging from the ceiling? Yeah. For baptized, that was a long, great reminder. Yeah, long before me, but I've heard wonderful things about you, it. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I've only heard about it in. in uh, so you don't know what happened. To There's it. a picture of it in one of the. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's a great reminder. Right. Yeah. To pray for those who've been baptized. Sure. Yeah. That was a great piece. A few other things that Luther talks about. Um, he talks about, again, these people that suggest that baptism is an ex external thing, he calls it. He says, uh, he says, of baptism, it is a most precious thing, even though to all appearances it may not be worth a straw. And isn't that kind of how it is? We bring these children to baptism to the water, and they look just the same when you're done with them as they did when they started. <laughs> And Luther says it, you know, by all appearances, it may not be worth a straw, but he said it's the most, it is the most precious thing. He says to be baptized, well, he says, commanded by God and performed in his name. To be baptized in God's name is to be baptized by God himself. Um, so again, God's work, our hands, right? Um, this is God's work. Here we must evaluate not the person according to the works, but the works according to the person from whom they derive their worth. So in other words, he's saying, um, again, it's not about the, the man or the, the woman who does this baptism, but it's about the God, um, about the God behind that baptism and the work that God is doing. Um, again, it's a, it's a precious thing because it's God who is doing it. It's not you or me or um, anyone else. It's, it's God's work. Um, he says, um, because baptism is not dazzling like, like uh, the work we do, um, there are those, again, he's railing against those who see it as an as a, a external thing. He says, because baptism is not dazzling like the, work we do, uh, like the work we do. I don't know how much work I do that's dazzling. You can dazzle us with your music, but um, Alice can dazzle us with her music, but... Um, he says it's regarded as uh, worthless by these, these folks who are saying that. So, again, it's a, it's a thing that both sacraments are something we have to look at not with eyes of reason, right? But with eyes of faith, with eyes of faith. Um, 
Other questions? Good discussion today. Um, I want to chime in on one point that you made. You know, Luther is arguing about uh, this concern over, you know, whether baptism is is valid in certain circumstances. And that goes back even to to the early church because when the early church was being persecuted, there was concern about whether baptism or uh, communion as a sacrament was valid because there were certain pastors who had recanted their faith when the state came to persecute them and then later, you know, came back or recanted in public and then were in private continuing to function as pastors or bishops. And so the church wrestled with that issue for a while and finally decided that, uh, like Luther says, that no, the sacraments are ultimately uh, all about what, what God is doing. So if the pastor, uh, you know, gets uh, persecuted by the state and asked to recant his faith and then later turns around and goes and baptizes infants, that it's ultimately God's work that the baptism is still valid regardless of whether that pastor has renounced his or her faith or not. And then the church eventually considered that belief that the baptism was invalid to be a heresy. So there's a lot of precedent for, for Luther's argument there, that it's ultimately not up to the person who's doing it or the person it's being done to, but it's all, all God's work in that. Okay, good. Yeah, so the church has wrestled long and hard with these questions. It's not, uh, again, it's not something they came to uh, lightly. So again, the same questions are asked about uh, the sacrament of the altar, page 33. We've discussed some of this already, but um, again, what is the sacrament of the altar? The true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself. So again, there you have that uh, requirement that it's instituted by God. Uh, instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and drink. There again, uh, Laurel kind of answers your correct question, for us Christians to eat and drink. Again, it's meant uh, originally, certainly that was the understanding that you were baptized to receive communion. Mm -hmm. um, and that hasn't changed, that, that general practice hasn't changed, but again, some churches have opened up communion to all who are there. Because we don't say in the bulletin, you used to say, like, anybody is welcome to take communion, but it didn't say anybody, everybody's welcome to take communion yeah. unless you're not baptized. Right, yeah. No, we <laughs> don't say that. We didn't put that yeah. in there. Yeah. Do you require them to be baptized, though, before they are confirmed? Which is, in yes. essence, their well, baptism. Yes. Right. Yeah, and I do have a boy that's in ninth grade now that's not baptized, and I just can't seem to get family off the dime to do it. Uh, so well, I don't know how we'll handle that one, but it's yeah. I mean, because yes, it is their bat. I mean, it's their. It's that moment when they take for themselves the vows that were made for them in infant baptism, you know, um, which is what Ardell is talking about. I think I had one of my my girlfriends was baptized the day she was confirmed. I've had well, I haven't had it the day. I've had one boy that was um, baptized. Uh, in a service, his confirmation uh, friends were his sponsors. They became his sponsors, which was kind of nice. Um, mm, so, neat. yeah. So, uh, so again, he talks about where it's written about communion. He talks about the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then Saint Paul. Uh, John's Gospel would, uh, doesn't really talk about Holy Communion specifically, but in chapter six of John, it, that's where Jesus talks about being the bread of life, and uh, we we have four to five, five weeks of uh, lectionary around the bread of life every third year. So we get to uh, really dig into that from John's gospel. Most pastors dread that because it's five weeks of kind of the same recurring theme, you know, and it's yeah. hard to, sometimes hard to be creative. It's, it's one of the things I appreciate about having moved to weekly communions because mm -hmm. it was always the, an odd time. It had falls, you know, during the late summer every third year but to do communion once a month, and then for this six-week stretch, you have Jesus constantly saying, I am the bread of life, I am the bread of life, I am the bread of life. You know, and to not be receiving communion during that time was always just, uh, just bugs me. It's like, why are we not, not doing that? It just makes so much sense. But. Yeah. 
Page 34, he asks the question, what is the benefit of eating and drinking? Again, he says, the words given for you and shed for you. For the forgiveness of sin, show us that forgiveness of sin, life, and salvation are given to us in the sacrament through these words. Because where there is forgiveness of sin, there is also life and salvation. Again, what a great promise. Uh, but again, to the world, it just looks like eating and drinking, right? Nothing. We do this every day of our lives. Again, one of my think one of these things that this spurs me to think about, though, is how can we sometimes, at least, reclaim kind of the uh, early church's practice of having communion in a full meal. You know, again, we've we've made it so ritual that we sometimes for uh, we neglect the practicality that it served of sharing the meal, of sharing the table fellowship, of sharing life together. Right? We just kind of come up, get our little piece of bread and our little cup of wine, again, which is fine. It, it, um, it has become meaningful for us who do that, but for people who don't understand that practice, there's very little, uh, uh, very little fellowship in that meal, very little inclusion for them in a sense. So, so how can we then, uh, for the outsider, create those moments? And I think... I think you as people of God can do that. I, I've always said that when we eat a meal together and we pray, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, let these gifts be, uh, let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen. So we invite Christ in that prayer to be the host of the meal. <coughs> if Christ is the host of the meal, in a sense, that becomes a Eucharistic meal, doesn't it? A, a meal of good news, a meal of life. So you, in a sense, can preside um, you know, and talk about this kind of blessing with, with others that, um, that may not know. Um, it would be interesting to try to lay out a vision of what it would look like if, if we were to have communion uh, around table together mm -hmm. uh, in, in the manner in which the Passover meal yeah. is celebrated. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, where the, the question is asked, what does this mean? Yeah. Why do we have the yeah. bitter herbs? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, right. And, and yeah. But in what some, if, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. But in some respects, I think of a communion is it's a banquet for sinners. Mm -hmm. You give your sermon, which is like someone standing up at the front cheering us on. You know, there's hope. Let's mm -hmm. keep going, and we've got the music, and so it's like a. Every Sunday is a banquet for sinners. Yeah, I think that too, but we're insiders, right? Again, we're <laughs> insiders. So yeah, absolutely. So thank you, God, for the foretaste. Again, a foretaste of the feast to come, right? I mean, I love that language, but again, outsiders don't necessarily understand it. Just the comment about the communion of saints. It's half a circle down here, the saints, and it combines with the half a circle up, up in heaven. So that's the communion of saints, the symbolism of it. Mm -hmm. And this is what I felt very, very special about communion at the altar in a half circle. Actually, the person I heard that from first, Ardell, was the person who uh, translated this. His, pay, his name is on the um, credits page with this uh, Wingert, Timothy Wingert. He came to our um, Senate Assembly in Western Iowa maybe 30 days, maybe 60 days after his wife had died of cancer. He was our keynote speaker, and he, was, he told us about, the, uh, about his um, experience with the pastor who said, you know, his wife, he came to his wife's bedside, and she just said, I'm tired. And he said, it's okay. He said, we will carry you now. And that was one powerful story, saying the church will carry you. You can rest in that... Christ who has claimed you. But then he also told about a girl who he had confirmed, or was preparing to confirm her faith um, through the process of confirmation, and he, was, he met, like I do, with uh, each child individually, and he just couldn't really get that confession of faith out of her. Finally, he just said to her, do you remember anything from our time together in confirmation? Well, she said, I remember you telling us about communion. Um, where when we come to the rail, the, the, the rail is never closed. It's never a full circle, you know, or a closed circle. There's always a space there. 
And she said, I remember you telling us that it's not closed because the other half is completed in, in heaven. And her father had died uh, some years ago, and that for her was a word of comfort. You know, that it isn't just me and you eating, but it's us eating with all those who have gone before us, you know. Yeah, that's a powerful, powerful thing. Um, and we can, we can confess that if we believe that this is for the forgiveness of sins and that it, it brings life and salvation. So. And again, then he talks about how can, it, uh, how can eating and drinking do such good things, great things. And he, again, he comes back to um, Jesus. Eating and drinking certainly do not do it, but rather the words that are recorded, given for you, and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Th these words, when accompanied by the physical eating and drinking, are es essential thing, the essential thing in the sacrament. And whoever believes these words has, again, trusts these words, has what they declare and state, namely, forgiveness of sins. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there is life and salvation. So then who then receives the sacrament worthily? Fasting and bodily preparation are in fact a fine external discipline. But a person who has faith in these words, given for you and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, is really worthy and well prepared. However, a person who does not believe these words or doubts them is unworthily and unpre unworthy and unprepared because the words for you require tr truly believing hearts. So he's, uh, you know, he's wrestling with this himself, I think, this idea of um, what makes us worthy, what makes us prepared. Um, I, I think today we would argue this idea of doubts. I mean, I think we all have doubts, you know, from time to time. Um, we were wondering about a baby that was not baptized and died. Uh, well, again, Luther, like I said, Luther would say that... Uh, it was meant to be baptized, you know, but it was a, yeah. either a miscarriage or yeah. a early yeah. birth. Luther would say there's no condemnation. Where there's no law, there is no uh, punishment. You know, a child, again, can't understand the law, doesn't know the requirements. So I would say that um, Luther would be very compassionate as a pastor to reassure that family that your child... And you'd have to go to Psalm 139. You know, the Lord knew this child before it was uh, even born. It knew all the days that were prepared for it before one of them existed. You know, knew this child while it was being knit together in its mother's womb. You know, again, I think there's a number of uh, passages from Scripture that, uh, that can reassure us that a child who dies outside of baptism is, is uh, a child upon whom... Who, upon whose uh, eye God looks, you know, with, with grace and favor. So, uh, I would say that there is baptism outside, or is, there is salvation outside of baptism, but baptism is the gift to the church to say, to give us that reassurance and, and the assurance that God is with us and, and uh, holds on to us forever. The story I love is that one about the widow who lost one silly coin and stayed awake all night sweeping the house. You know, it's connected with the Good Shepherd. And uh, um, one other story. What's the third story? The lost pearl. coin, the lost sheep, pearl. and the lost pearl. You know, so um, this is how God is. God's going to stay awake all night looking for you. God's going to stay awake. Um, not one, Jesus says, whom the Father has given me will be snatched from my hands. The words of John. So there are just, again, many, many assurances that, uh, that we can be confident in God, that that child could do nothing to be saved and that child could do nothing to be condemned. So uh, life is God's and God will preserve that life. So. And, you know, there are people who have many, had many miscarriages and, and really struggle with that. And, uh, um, and God is all-powerful. Yeah. Yes, he is. All right, let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let it be known I finished up before Steve last week. So. <laughs>